SFT and SFTR, we didn't get to it. So we will continue with that this uh, in today's class. Good morning. So what is sensitivity? <coughs> it is defined as the minimum signal you, you can receive at the antenna while, while satisfying the minimum SNR condition. Okay, so once the uh, signal goes through the full receiver chain, at the end of the receiver chain once you have down converted it goes to the baseband, you have a minimum SNR requirement. Okay, each modulation scheme might have a different SNR requirement for a given bandwidth and so on. So uh, we will have a certain SNR requirement and that will decide your sensitivity. So let us try to find an expression for the sensitivity. Okay. So remember, do you remember this, the available noise, the available noise power at the antenna, we did this a few days ago. You remember that it was KTB watts, right? You remember this, we did this a few classes ago. Okay. What is your input SNR? It is nothing but your received signal power over KTB. Okay. That is your input SNR. Okay. Also remember one of the, one of the definitions of noise figure is input SNR over output SNR. Is that right? Okay. So what this means is okay, SNR in we know. So this is actually we which way should we put it in? We want the actually we want P sig, so let's put it the other way. <coughs> but that's okay. We'll we'll work over it. Over F, right? P sig is times F times KTB. So we want to find out P sig or rather P sig minimum. What is the minimum signal you can receive? Okay. So let us express both sides in dB because that is easier because we are going to work with dB quantities. Okay. So you have SNR in dB plus your noise noise figure plus okay now <coughs> kt is a constant factor so let's take it out Okay, so what this means is, this is pretty straightforward, right? Your signal occupies a particular bandwidth. You are integrating the noise over that bandwidth. Then you have the noise from the your uh, uh, receiver, and then at the end of the chain, you have a minimum SNR. So if you want to find out a minimum sensitivity, you need to put in SNR minimum for the SNR. Everything else is fixed, right? And what is 10 log KT? happens to be equal to <coughs> okay of course per hertz because you have taken out the bandwidth right ktp is power in watts so this is dbm per hertz <coughs> okay k is boltzmann constant t is 300 degrees we'll just put in room temperature okay so 
So your input minimum power is minus 174 dBm per hertz plus noise figure plus plus SNR min. This is your uh, sensitivity. Okay. This is also called the noise noise floor. Yes, so that KTB already assumes it's the available noise power. Yes. So okay, so the reason it's called dBm per hertz. Remember that the available noise power is KTB watts, right? So once you have taken B, KT is actually watts per hertz. By multiple by 300. No, you need to divide it by 1 milliwatt, right? Because you are doing dBm, right? Don't, don't calculate the load, it will definitely come out once you refer it to 1, uh, one milliwatt, okay? And this is called the input noise load, <coughs> okay? We will see why we are doing this because when we get to the dynamic range, we want to use this noise load expression, okay? Okay? Also note that it is a function of your bandwidth. One thing to remember. So, what that means is, let us say you are designing a narrow band system. It may look like the, uh, so if you are designing a narrow band system, obviously this is very small. It look like the receiver is very sensitive, but it may not be, right. If you are comparing two, uh, two systems, you have to take into account the fact that the bandwidth of one, one system might be wider or lower than the bandwidth of the next, of a different system. So, it is not just enough if you just quote the uh, sensitivity, you also have to quote the bandwidth of the signal. Okay, keep that in mind. <coughs> okay. Okay. What is the dynamic range of the system, of any system in general? So it's usually the maximum signal that can be tolerated over the <coughs> minimum signal, right? That meets uh, SNR requirements. So in our case, we are going to define it slightly differently. I mean, that is a normal definition. In our case, we know that we define the linearity and the maximum signal based on IIP3, okay, based on the intermodal components, okay. So what we are going to do is we are going to define it slightly differently. So this is, so we are going to define it by, hey. So we are going to define it such that the actually sorry. So max power level, input power level, when the IM3 product is lies below the noise floor, okay, over the minimum signal. We already calculated that. Okay, so this is your. This is called your spurious free dynamic range. Sorry? Okay, so the maximum power at which your IM3 still stays below the noise floor. So remember, okay, so remember we had, we given omega 1, omega 2, right? What do you get at the output? You get this. These are the IM3 products, okay? Obviously, you, you keep increasing this power. Sorry, you keep increasing this power. What happens? This guy also increases because at the end it, it is going to be proportional. It probably increases much faster, right? So at some point of time, so obviously let's say you're at your sensitivity point, minimum signal, right? Typically your uh, IM3 products will be 40, 50, 60 dB below your signal. So really, it's uh, you know your SNR requirement will typically be 10 dB or something, 10 or 15 dB. Okay? So typically, you know, it's buried under the noise floor at when when you are at your sensitivity point. However, as you keep increasing your input power, so I mean if what that means is you may be getting closer to the, uh, uh, let us say the uh, transmitter, okay, that is a simple case where it could increase. So then what happens is eventually your, the IM3 products will start peaking up above the noise floor and those are actually called spurs when you have unwanted uh, tones, 
peaking out of the uh, uh, noise floor, they are usually called spurious or spurs, spurious frequencies. Okay, or spurs. So that's why it's called spuriously dynamic range. Okay, let's try to cal calculate that. I think if you remember this, we can, we got an expression, right, of for IIP3 in terms of delta p. So we'll use that. Okay. IIP3 is Pn plus delta P over 2. This is the one we got using a single measurement. <coughs> oh, sorry. Right. Now, also note that if you now we are going to start expressing, we have expressed everything in dB terms. Remember that. Uh oh. Okay. Give me a minute. What is the gain for the intermod terms? It's the same as the gain for the fundamental. Right? Because it is lying in band. Right? And it's actually a very low, very small signal. So what that means is, will be the same as if you refer it to the input, right? Both are going to have a gain g. So if you have a delta p here in db, you are going to have the same delta p here in db, not in uh, linear terms obviously. Is that clear? So we are going to re rewrite this. Okay. Pn is <coughs> sorry. <coughs> is that clear? Okay. So now remember that your noise floor is plus your noise figure, okay? And <coughs> you want your p. I'm, so the tipping tipping point would be the maximum signal you can apply is when p i m three in is equal to your noise floor, <coughs> right? You don't want it sticking out of the this thing. So it is you set those two to be equal and then calculate your p, p n. Okay, and we already know P in men. It's nothing but NFL plus SNR men. Okay, SFDR of course in DB is P in max minus P in min in DB. In linear terms it is the ratio, in DB terms it is a difference. So it's two IAP three minus what does P in men? <clears throat> 
sorry so this is the expression for your spurious free dynamic range is that clear <coughs> so as soon as you know your iip3 and your noise load and your minimum snr required you can calculate your there are many ways of expressing this this is just one way obviously you know that the nfl also depends on uh, this thing right you can write it in terms of sensitivity you can write it in terms of a bunch of things okay okay <coughs> sorry so so okay so if you have an equation uh, db is relative right whereas dbm is absolute so if you have a let's say you have an equation you can say p let's say one power quantity in dbm equals another power quantity in dbm plus a db because it's relative remember it's a ratio of powers right whereas dbm is absolute with uh, directly related to one let's say 1 milliwatt in this case okay so you can add dbm and db but it will end up in a dbm quantity okay okay Oops, sorry. You should plot uh, it slightly better. So let's say this is your noise floor. Show some. So we'll plot your P in and P out versus P in, right? In dB. This is your noise floor, okay? And remember, this is your IM3 curve. So the point where it actually crosses it is your SFDR point. So if you had to plot your right below it, let us say. So you plot your signal to noise ratio, okay? What will happen? at this point it will keep increasing with your signal because the ion 3 products are much lower obviously so it will keep increasing as your signal goes <clears throat> and you know after this point it will start decreasing right because now your distortion component comes into being so your this is your sfdr that is the maximum right that is your spurious free dynamic range this one you are plotting uh, s to n plus d let's signal to noise plus distortion obviously signal to noise ratio will keep increasing right the distortion signal to distortion ratio will keep decreasing okay your sfdr will correspond to this point right because this is the point which we just calculated and this is your noise floor p in my this is your sensitivity okay so next we'll move on to calculating the two port parameters for a mosfet okay we talked about this last class so let's uh, try to do this quickly we'll try to uh, Okay, we'll try to do it quickly. For a full description, you can check out the textbook. I think uh, Thomas Lee's textbook, section 11, section 11.2, actually, has the full derivation. But we'll try to do it fairly completely. But we'll see. Okay, in the interest of time. This is your gate. <coughs> B. 
drain and this is your source. This is your source. Remember the Van der Zeele model for gate noise. You can put in GG and CG as sorry. GMVGS, this is your drain noise, this is your gate noise. Everybody remembers this model, right? Okay. Also, sorry. Also remember expressions for drain noise and gate noise. Okay. Yes. So it is actually GD naught for a long channel. What we decided is GD naught is equal to GM for a transistor, and therefore we put it, you know, as 4K D GM. The actual expression is GD naught. Okay. And we'll see. We'll find out that it actually the the noise actually overall noise depends on the ratio of GD naught to GM also. Okay, for a long channel MOSFET it's 1, but for a short channel MOSFET it's not necessarily 1. Okay. Now we are also going we are also going to define a correlation coefficient C, which is the correlation between drain and uh, drain noise and gate noise. Okay, this is the correlation between the drain noise and the gate noise. <coughs> it so turns out it is so from experimental uh, evidence we know that it is J.395 for a long channel MOSFET. But we are going to assume it is the same for a short channel. Okay. And what we are going to do is we are going to calculate Rn, Gu and Yc. These are the things we want to calculate, right? Remember there are four parameters Gc, Bc, Rn and Gu for a two port. So we are going to calculate each one of these. <coughs> what do we know? We know that Rn is 4kt delta f. It just so happens that if there is a noise, it is 90 degrees phase shifted. That is possible, right? So, GU is IU squared over 4 kT delta F and this which happens to be IC over EN. This is how we define these parameters if you remember. This is uh, last week, right? Okay. And how will it look like if you represented the MOSFET with that? I n squared C G S. Okay. So we want to bring it to an equivalent form. How do you do it? Easiest way is find out short circuit, open circuit values because that will eliminate one or the other of I n or E n and then do the same thing for the original model here. That is that's the easiest way to find out, right? Because you are trying to reduce this to an equivalent two port parameters with E n and I n. Okay? So the two things should be equal at all impedances and all driving points and so on. 
so you can look at the short circuit and the open circuit points okay okay so first what we'll do is we'll short the input okay <clears throat> once you short the input obviously i n no longer figures only e n figures in your equation i n gets is completely diverted through the short circuit right okay what this means is vgs is zero right <clears throat> and so gate noise is completely diverted so your output noise is only the drain noise nothing but um i and d squared in the case of a two port nothing but gm times en squared so you have a gate noise en right actually gm squared sorry because we're dealing with powers <coughs> okay so what does this mean rn is so it's gamma gd not over gm squared right and we'll also define a new term which is alpha which is gd not over gm this becomes gamma over alpha gm okay so we found out rn in terms of the mosfet parameters okay so next let's look at let's try to find out gu and um, yc okay oh sorry yes it's gm over gd not thank you okay next we are going to open circuit the input and find out what happens so first what we'll do is let's consider only the drain noise then we'll move on to add the uh, gate noise also so let's see what happens when you just add right so of course you have a drain noise you refer it to the gate you get i and d squared over gm squared which is a voltage source converted back to a current source with your j omega cgs it gives you this this expression is that clear to everyone okay and of course this is en squared times j omega cgs squared so what that means is if you consider drain noise only in1 is completely correlated with en right so that is one important point
okay so now let's consider let's consider both of these guys okay so what we're going to do is we're going to split this the gate noise into a correlated portion and an uncorrelated portion okay which is correlated with en and <coughs> uncorrelated with en what is the definition for yc this is just the correlated current over the right over en remember the total correlated current over en right so what is that it's in1 plus over en is that clear What is I n one over E n? You already know that, right? It's J omega C G S. Okay, so we are going to work uh, work a little bit with the second component, and see we'll rewrite it in a slightly different way. We know that E n is what is en en is nothing but gm squared times id squared idn squared the drain noise okay okay sorry right okay <clears throat> then what we're going to do <coughs> is that correct sorry it's wrong gm is in the numerator okay where is this guy ind is gm times en right so en is ind over gm so we are going to multiply and divide by the conjugate of ind okay now we are also going to multiply and divide by okay what is this term <coughs> remember the correlation coefficient how we defined it ingc ind star over root of ing squared root of ind squared c times right 
right? You'll have one root of i and d squared from this guy left over. What is uh, i and g squared? It's 4 kt delta g g de de delta f and this is 4 kt gamma g d naught delta f. So, you are going to have by gamma g d naught. Remember this is <coughs> You can replace GG is omega squared CGS squared over 5 GD naught. Okay. So, and then you can take out J omega CGS as a common factor outside. 1 plus, oops, sorry, J GM mod C, you will get a 1 over GD naught. You have root of delta over gamma, actually delta over 5 gamma. Okay, and we know GM over GD naught is alpha. Okay, what I wrote is, I'll show you. I just wrote as wrote C as J times mod of C. That's all. Because we know that J C is J 0.395 for a long channel MOSFET. For a short channel MOSFET, what we will assume is we will assume that the, it is still purely imaginary, but it might be a different value. Okay? If it is the same value, we just put in 0.395. If it is a different value, we will just write it differently. That is all. I just wrote C as J times mod C. Okay? So, this is y c. Okay, so, you have calculated one more important parameter. So, we are trying to calculate all four parameters. right? Now, what is one thing you know? So, sorry. Remember that y c was g c plus j b c. Okay? In this case, we are getting g c equals 0. The reason we are getting that is because we assumed there is no gate resistance, there is no input resistive component. Okay? That is the reason why. If obviously if there was a gate resistance, may either due to routing or due to something else, maybe a poly resistance, that will give a real component in general. Okay? Okay. So, now we want to calculate G u. So, we want to write i n g squared as okay. and obviously i n g c and i n g g u are completely at uh, orthogonal to each other. So, you can write this as Okay. What do we know about this guy? INGC is correlated to your drain noise and we know that the correlation factor is C, right? So, you can write it as 4 kT delta GG delta f into 1 minus sorry one minute
right remember that so once you have a correlation factor you can split it this way and gu depends only on i and gu okay that's this guy it's um okay so that's your gu and you know all of these parameters let's assume you know delta for now okay okay so what did we want we wanted b of this minus bc <coughs> by the way we have assumed that the source node is your uh, common node right between your input and output port that automatically means we are actually finding this out for a common source mosfet right okay so what does this tell you first of all let's say you are you, you at a particular frequency you are matching bs to b opt okay first of all the negative sign shows that it's inductive in character okay however the fact that it's proportional to omega normally if you have if it's inductive in character is proportional to 1 over omega l right 1 over omega l would be the susceptance of a of an inductor so this thing has the right sign but the wrong frequency characteristic so what that means is fundamentally you can do a noise match you can only do a narrow band noise match okay because if you try to match it using let's say an inductor a particular inductor you try to get an inductive characteristic the inductor will have the opposite frequency characteristic from this one okay at one particular frequency or over a narrow range of frequencies you can try to equate the two but you can't do a broadband match it's quite difficult okay what is your g opt remember this expression it's g over uh, uh, rn minus gc squared and if you calculate this out this happens to be <laughs> okay so this is the expression for g opt remember the expression for f min in terms of right <clears throat> all of these parameters this was the expression now we can calculate what happens to the what kind of minimum noise figure you can get so you can plug in all the numbers so what you get is
okay so you get something like this where it's actually f min is actually proportional to omega over omega t so obviously the closer you get to omega t the worse the noise figure will get okay okay so obviously so what that okay one other uh, you know um, result from this is that as you go to faster and faster processes omega t gets better and better right for a given current so what that means is you actually your minimum noise figure achievable actually gets better so things actually get a little bit easier if you go to if you go to a faster process if you want to design lnas okay okay so we will continue next class